Hello, welcome to worship. I just want to make a couple announcements before we begin. I'd ask that you continue to remember Edith Elberty in your prayers. Um, she's waiting for a release and then the trip home. So thank you for your continued prayers for Edith and her family. Also, I'll mention it in the email, but if you have any cotton material or remnants, if you could bring those to the church, I'll list the times that you could drop those off. Um, we have quilters at home who are making lots of quilts with their time, and they're running out of material. So I will include that in the email as well. We begin in the name of the Creator, Sustainer, and Redeemer. Amen. A reading from Jeremiah 28. Then the prophet Jeremiah spoke to the prophet Hananiah in the presence of the priests and all the people who were standing in the house of the Lord. And the prophet Jeremiah said, Amen. May the Lord do so. May the Lord fulfill the words that you have prophesied and bring back to this place from Babylon the vessels of the house of the Lord and all the exiles. But listen now to this word that I speak in your hearing and the hearing of all the people. The prophets who preceded you and me from ancient times prophesied war, famine, and pestilence against many countries and great kingdoms. As for the prophet who prophesies peace, when the word of that prophet comes true, then it will be known that the Lord has truly sent the prophet. Here ends the reading. Verses 1 and 4 and 15 and 18 from Psalm 89. I will sing of your steadfast love, O Lord, forever. With my mouth I will proclaim your faithfulness to all generations. I will declare that your steadfast love is established forever, your faithfulness as firm as the heavens. You said I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to my servant David, I will establish your descendants forever and build your throne for all generations. Happy are the people who know the festal shout, who walk, O Lord, in the light of your countenance. They exalt in your name all day long and extol your righteousness. For you are the glory of their strength. By your favor, your horn is exalted. For our shield belongs to the Lord. Our King is the Holy One of Israel. Here ends the reading. For the prayer of the day, I would like to share a prayer called when I'm longing for peace within and without. Let us pray. Beautiful spirit of peace, I'm longing for peace within and peace around. For peace in families, peace in our neighborhoods, peace between nations, peace for Mother Earth, peace in the quiet depths of my own soul. Peace for people ripped open by painful divides on streets and in conversations. Peace for friends facing suicide or prison. Peace for loved ones living through divorce and death and hard anniversaries. Peace for people leaving home because their jobs relocated or the money wasn't there anymore. Peace for those who uncovered a shocking revelation about someone they loved and they aren't sure what to do or whom to trust. Peace for all whose greatest fears actualized before their eyes and sighs and tears became a daily language. Peace that holds all of us in wholeness when we're carrying grief or heartache, chaos or tumultuous questions. When what's most precious to us was swept away in one swift wave, or the world's teeming with so much noise and busyness that we can't hear ourselves think. I ask you, spirit of peace and hope, to blow a breath of balm upon the wounds and lead us toward bone-deep belief. Even in this challenging landscape, may your presence bring peace, passing all understanding, as it strengthens our bodies, renews our minds, and heals this land. I thank you that peace is not a dream, but a promise, and you are the giver of peace. Amen. A reading from Romans, the sixth chapter. Therefore, do not let sin exercise dominion in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions. No longer present your members to sin as instruments of wickedness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and present your members to God as instruments of righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under the law, but under grace. 
What then? Should we sin because we're not under the law but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient people, you are people who obey. Either sin leads to death or obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you, having been slaves to sin, have become obedient from the heart to the form of teaching to which you were entrusted. And that you, having been set free from sin, having become slaves of righteousness. I'm speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. But just as you once presented your members as slaves to purity and to greater and greater iniquity, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness for sanctification. When you were slaves to sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. So what advantage did you get from things that you are now ashamed? The end of those things is death. But now you have been freed from sin and belong to God. The advantage you get is sanctification. The end is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Here ends the reading. Our gospel is Matthew 10, verses 40 through 42. Jesus concluded, whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of, the prophet, of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the war, reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. Here ends the reading. Our gospel today is only three verses long. But then we remember the context in which Jesus is speaking and all that came before, and these words become even more powerful. Chapter 10 in the Gospel of Matthew is Jesus reminding us what it means to be a follower of his. We've had three weeks of this now, of Jesus commissioning, sending the disciples out, but preparing them, telling them what it means to follow him, including all the hard stuff. But with these three verses, he sends them out, reminded that they are followers of his, whether he's with them or whether they go out on their own. These three verses are his farewell. Think about a cup of cold water, maybe especially today when it's very hot outside. Think about ancient Palestine. What it would have been like to come to somebody and receive a cup of cold water. What a sign of welcome. What a sign of belonging. To receive not just a drink, but a cup of cold water in a time and a place where there was no refrigeration or ice. To think of the gift of that coolness as people walked 8, 10, 12 miles a day to get from place to place. We're called to welcome each other with not just the minimal, but to give above and beyond, to give the very best in each and every circumstance. Jesus says, whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. In the ancient world, there was not the individual I. If someone welcomed you, they were welcoming all of your family. They were welcoming anyone you represented. So to welcome one person was to welcome a community. It was understood that to welcome one person was very communal. So as Jesus says these words, it's understood that to welcome him is to welcome God. Suddenly we're reminded of this interconnectedness, even in this time where we're so separated from each other, that we are connected because all of us are children of God. We're part of God's family, called to do things like give a cup of cold water. Oscar Wilde once said, the smallest act of kindness is worth more than the grandest intention. The newest research, which shouldn't surprise us, shows that people who receive small signs of love and gratitude, appreciation each day, are more positive, optimistic, and are healthier. Think about that. If people who claim to be Christians just treated each other with kindness, told someone else they appreciated them, and did acts of love. Think of how different our world would be. 
We are changed as the one who gives and as the one who receives. It's that connectedness that we claim and experience in those moments. Scott Elwin says most of us don't need a major intervention. What we need is a bit of hope and a bit of reassurance that we're not in this alone. I don't know about you, but some days it all seems too much. What I'd like to do each day when I get up is end world hunger, find a cure for every disease and illness in the world, end every ism there is, provide housing to every homeless person and refugee, and a list of about 50 other things. That's what I'd like to do each day. And that can be daunting and impossible. And then we hear Jesus say, a cup of cold water. It seems so small, so insignificant, until we remember the power of small things, of a small gesture. Getting ice chips from someone when that's all your body will receive to the person who can't even lift their hand to their mouth, that gift of the ice chips on their inner lip is just enormous. Three little words, I love you or I forgive you, makes such a difference. It changes who we are, it changes how we see ourselves and the world. A hand that reaches for ours when we really started to think we were alone in this world. A card that comes in the mail with our name on it that says to us that day, especially when we thought we couldn't take any more uncertainty in our life, here's a piece of paper with our name and words of grace given to us in our very homes. I think of people who will bring material and have brought material and cloth remnants, just pieces, just what looks to me like junk and somehow our quilters will make blankets of love that will transform lives. Jesus reminds us that small gestures brought together create such change. Some of you may remember the scene from the French Open last year as Nicolas Mahat was defeated. It was a game he was supposed to win and he would go on to participate in the championship round had he won, but he was defeated. He did the obligatory shaking hands with Leonardo Mayer, and then he sat down defeated in his chair. Suddenly from the stands, his seven-year-old son ran to him, hugged him, and the crowd went wild. As this father and son held each other, the crowd cheered and clapped. Finally, he withdrew from the embrace, held his son's hand, and they walked off the tennis court. Cheering crowds, people were giving him a standing ovation. If you had the sound turned off, you would have thought he was the winner of that game. And I think many of us would believe he was. A cup of cold water. Someone who stands with us in our greatest darkness. We are children of God. We welcome every human being as if they were Jesus and God entering our time, our space, our home, our sanctuary. And we welcome them with a cup of cold water with food, with a listening ear. We listen to their stories. We listen to their pain. We welcome others by sharing in their grief and their shame. We stand with them and say, this is not who you are. We stand with you and for you. We welcome each other. As much as I'd love to end world hunger, we will do it together by sharing a cup of cold water, by fighting for policies that are more fair, by bringing food for feeding South Dakota, by serving the banquet, together these small gestures say the kingdom of God is here right now, and we proclaim his presence in our world. Let us pray. Dear God, open our eyes to those around us who need a cup of cold water and kindle our hearts to respond to them in love and action. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us proclaim our faith together with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven 
He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Called into unity with one another in the whole creation, we pray for our shared world. God of abundance, when you promise deliverance, it is because you want us to fully live. We pray for those who are sick or sorrowing, for those who are oppressed, for peace within and between nations, for the health of the earth. Bless this congregation to be a place of welcome for those who speak the truth and a place of comfort in the name of Christ. God of mercy, inspire authorities, judges, and politicians to act with compassion. Turn death to life, fear to hope, and lies to love. Remind us that our most powerful witness to the power of your love is given from a place of vulnerability. Grant us the vision to recognize where you are leading us and shape our shared future. Set free to live more faithfully with one another and sent out to be a sign of your grace and welcome. Holy One, receive our prayers for the sake of Jesus Christ, and whom is life now and forever. Amen. We pray as our Lord Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace.